Hello and welcome to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and if this is your first time listening, then this is the show where we discuss everything to do with past life and evolution with a different focus and expert interviewee in every episode. This time we're joined by Dr. Charlotte Brassie of Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK and we'll be talking about bacula. So yes, we're having an entire episode on a single bone. And if you don't know what a baculum is, and I'm sure that many people won't, well, it's the bone found in the penis of many mammals. If you want to know what one looks like, then we've got the pictures that accompany this interview available on our website. And whilst you're there, we'd be appreciative if you could subscribe to the show or even donate to our overheads. All of the links you'll ever need are in the sidebar. We'd also love it if you could share this episode on social media. You can find our accounts by searching for Paleocast, and then share our posts with anyone you think might be interested in paleontology. Now, obviously this episode has an adult theme, but we do keep it clean and mature, and somehow I even refrain from sniggering for the most part. But, you lot know me, and so, what about puns I hear you ask? Will he, or won't he? There's only one way to find out. Hi Charlotte, thanks so much for coming on the show. No worries, nice to be on here, thank you. Right, I'd like to give the audience an impression of who you are and what you're all about. Yeah, yeah, but that sounds good. Uh, So uh, my name is Dr. Charlotte Brassi, and I am a BBSRC Research Fellow, uh, and I'm based at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, And currently, for my fellowship, I am trying to understand the evolution of mammal genitals, and particularly uh, the penis bone. Right, sure. How... How how did you begin working on that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's not really uh, my background. Uh, originally, uh, I actually did a, an undergraduate degree in geography and geology uh, at Manchester. Uh, I did a PhD with Bill Sellers as well at Manchester, and then uh, a short postdoc uh, with Paul Barrett at the NHM uh, working on the Sophie the Stegosaur project. So I kind of have a paleontology, functional morphology background. Um, how I came to be working on genitals. Um, I, actually, it was uh, I was at a conference um, at the NHM. It's called Tosca. It's a, a kind of a CT scanning conference. And um, someone was talking about bats uh, for their talk. And they were mentioning how you can use the penis bone of bats to uh, differentiate between different species. And they just had a, a kind of throwaway comment in their talk where they said, oh, and of course, we don't really know what this penis bone does. Uh, and I'm sitting there as a kind of functional morphologist biomechanic thinking, really, that surprises me. Um, so I just went home and Googled it. And it's like, yeah, we really haven't come to a conclusion about what it does. Um, and that coincided nicely with when uh, fellowships were starting to become available to, to apply for. So um, I thought, why not? Why not give it a go? Um, and, and yeah, luckily enough, I managed to, to secure myself a fellowship to study them. So the funding body must have seen the value in this research. It must have been like, sure, we actually we do want to fund like however much money like it's going to be tens of thousands of pounds or something to to understand how the penis bone evolved. Yes, yeah. Um, so it's BBSRC, so that's more of a, a bioscience uh, funding body. Um, typically, um, you would think that this kind of thing would fall under more of a, a NERC, like a natural environment remit, if it was just uh, evolutionary biology. Um, but also um, the kind of spin that I put on it for BBSRC is that uh, a lot of our lab model animals that we use, particularly the rodents, um, mustelids as well, ferrets, they all have a penis bone. Um, obviously, humans don't. Um, human uh, erectile dysfunction is a, is a massive problem in the UK. And some of the models that we're using to, to understand human penile pathologies some of these model animals have a penis bone and if we don't know what that bone does then um, it's very difficult to know if it's okay to use these kind of models okay well looking at genitals in in general um why do we study them what 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 can we learn 
Why do we study them? Um, well, they're very char charismatic, aren't they? I think that's why people are just fascinated by them. Um, yeah, they're really interesting. They tend to evolve really, really quickly compared to lots of other parts of the body. They're often one of the most morphologically diverse structures. Um, traditionally, in kind of taxonom uh, taxonomy, we use them to, to differentiate between species, so they're useful in that sense. Um, and why I like studying them is because it's it's actually quite difficult um, understanding uh, not just you know genital shape and anatomy, but actually understanding the the mechanics of copulation of sex is is really difficult because if it's all going well, then for internally fertilizing species, we shouldn't be able to see any of it, how it's happening. So it's a, it's a really uh, tricky thing to, to study. So with males, it's fairly obvious uh, what the genitals look like. But with females, that's a lot more internal a lot of the time. Is there also a, a corresponding variety in genitals in females? And can studying those also tell you, uh, well, pretty much equally tell you uh, how the genitals and how the species is evolving? Um, yes. So, so the, the first problem to address is we really don't know much at all about female genitalia comparatively. So there's a massive bias towards, uh, in terms of publishing on genital anatomy uh, towards the males, um, probably because they're just easier to study because they are external. Quite often they have at least some components of hard parts. So that's you know, an easier thing to, to measure, to quantify. Um, so really we're coming from a place where we just need to get just some of the most basic data for, for the female anatomy. Um, yeah, the problem is they're internal. Uh, you, obviously you can dissect out female reproductive tract, but then you're talking about something that's very you know, soft and squishy. So trying to just quantify basic things like, like lengths um, and shapes is actually really quite difficult. Um, so it's only very recently that really um, we've started to make use of new developments in imaging techniques, particularly things like CT scanning and staining, um, to actually begin to really quantify um, the shape of some of the female genitals. So uh, it's actually in the invertebrate community, they've been doing some really cool stuff with um, like copulating seed beetles, for example, and as they're copulating, they'll you know throw some liquid nitrogen over them and freeze them <laughs> mid population. Yeah. Um, and that's great because then you can put them in the CT scanner like that and you can see exactly how the genitals are interacting, which is obviously super cool. Um, can't really do that for vertebrates, fair enough. Can't get the ethics to do that, which is understandable. Um, so we're a bit more restricted. Um, they're doing some really interesting stuff in the States. Um, there's a lady called uh, Patty Brennan, who's doing some really neat stuff with uh, taking cadaveric female specimens, particularly whales, some pinnipeds, and actually injection molding the female tract, uh, and then you can dissect it out and then CT scan that. So you've got a kind of a you know, mold cast situation. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll be getting there, but the, the museum collections just aren't there. Uh, it's a bit more difficult to dissect out, um, but it should be super important. So that's why it's worthwhile doing. Um, so we know that we've got examples of, of sexual conflict um, in lots of different species. Um, in vertebrates, uh, the classic example is uh, the corkscrew duck penis. Mm. Um, it, you know, everyone kind of knows that the, the duck has a crazy cork, corkscrew penis, but also if you dissect out the female parts, it's also a corresponding you know, corkscrew vagina. So you've got to look at the two in context, if you know what I mean. Will those, I mean, we've, we've basically got lock and key there with, with the duck example, but do you find that those uh, would evolve together? Is, is there any uh, instance where uh, the female uh, genitalia would remain uh, fairly morphologically conservative and the male uh, would uh, evolve the, uh, the different forms? Or did, yeah, are, they, are they intrinsically linked or can they evolve separately? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure, actually. I would assume that they're, they're fairly, fairly tightly correlated. I can't think of any example off the top of my head where the, the female genital tract is, you know, um, fairly, um, you know, general across lots of related species where just the males have diversified. But I mean, again, part of the problem, if, if we're talking vertebrates, talking mammals, we just have absolutely no idea, really. Um Probably the closest that we've got recently is, again, looking at the cetaceans um, and I can't quite remember what the results of that were. But, yeah, I think I think the females tend to be fairly intimately linked with the males. 
Okay, so um, you've been mostly looking at the male reproductive structures, yeah? Um, at the moment, um, partly just for lack of um, female specimens. I would love to get more female specimens. Um, typically, I rely on either pre-existing museum collections or I uh, have a really, really useful collaboration with the um, National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. Uh, I work with Andrew Kitchener there. Uh, and he has this absolutely amazing uh, cadaveric collection of mammals in particular. Um, pretty much if any zoo animal passes away in the UK or even Europe, um, ultimately those cadavers tend to end up with Andrew in Edinburgh. Okay. So it's this incredible source. Yeah, for getting, you know, just crazy diverse species. You know, in my freezer at the moment, I've got... Uh, fossa, hyena, um, bush dogs, uh, just species that you'd have absolutely no chance of, of getting hold of. Um, so yeah, I have that collaboration at the moment, but it's it, it, it's a, a big ask um, for them to, to dissect these parts off for me. And um, how should we say, chopping off the male parts is is a lot easier than, than in, intricately dissecting out the female parts. Um, so I tend to get many more male um, genital samples than females. Um, so it really has to be much more of a, a focused and concerted effort to get the females. I'm, I'm actually surprised that you have this uh, freezer and all of this um, material made available to you. Um, I had just assumed that you were looking at just the, uh, the male penis bone, and as that's uh, one of the only bits that isn't going to decay over time, but I never realised that you were able to get all of these cadavers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really fortunate. Um, yeah, you'd be very limited if, if all we ever did was work uh, on the baculum. Uh, obviously, the baculum is, uh, you know, this penis bone. It's well mineralized. Uh, it's also kind of, um, it, I think, in in very historical older collections, it's just a bit of a novelty. So people like to collect it because it's a little bit funny. You can get out at a dinner party, you know, that kind of thing. So you know, I don't the, know what the, kind of dinner parties you've been going to. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, you should see it. Um, and have, like, uh, it, chunks of pineapple and cheese on the end of them. That sounds kind of like a hen do, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say now. Um, yes, the, the baculum does tend to be really comparatively well-represented museum collections. Um, and then sometimes you'll get spirit collections of the other genitals, but normally normally a lot less. Um, so, yeah, it, it's really fortunate that we can uh, work with a museum that is actively collecting. That's the most important part, is that, that Edinburgh is very, very lucky in having new um, collection space to actually expand, whereas obviously a lot of museums are just, you know, they're kind of already bursting, it seems. So then to have the flexibility to just take a whole elephant cadaver if one drops dead, not many places can do that, but, but Edinburgh can. So, yeah, they're really useful people to work with. Right, so let's focus on the baculum for a while. So other than hen and serving up starters, what's, what's it actually used for? That's the kind of million dollar question, really. Um, so there's lots of different ideas about what the baculum might be doing. Um, potentially, it's to actually uh, facilitate the initial kind of act of, of intromission uh, to overcome friction. Um, so that's a yeah, it's a difficult one to test, really. If um, if all we're ever looking at is just the the morphology of the baculum. So really, this is a case where we need to be looking preferably in vivo as well as actually looking at, at live animals uh, and how they copulate. So yeah, potentially it's used um, in intromission. Um, I should clarify that in terms of penis anatomy, um, the baculum only ever sits in the, the glands of the penis. So that's, uh, as humans, that's what we'd call like the head of the penis. Um, so obviously humans don't have one, but if we did, it would be comparatively small and it would sit in that small uh, area of tissue at the very, very end of the penis. Um, whereas some other animals have very elongate 
glands what you know the head of the penis is actually really long it, it comprises as a percentage quite a lot of the length of the whole penis um, and that tissue that makes up the glands is actually less uh, hydrostatic than, than what we call the shaft so it doesn't fill with blood as much it doesn't become as rigid so it could be that in having that bone there that's actually adding some kind of structural rigid, rigidity to the whole to the whole thing um, in other species, uh, the baculum can sometimes actually kind of extend from the tip of the penis. So um, certainly we've been looking at ferrets recently. And, you know, when you dissect off the cadaver, um, you can actually see the, the, the contours of the bone just from, from the external shape of the penis. So there is not much soft tissue between, between the actual penis at the outside of the penis and that baculum. Um, so in those cases, it really is the, the bone is almost interacting with the female reproductive parts. Uh, and when they've got kind of crazy shapes to them, they've got you know, curves and prongs. Um, some people have suggested that that's for uh, stimulating the female. Um, in some species of mammals, the females don't ovulate um, spontaneously. They have to be induced to ovulate through actual copulation. So it could be that in having these, you know, crazy distal appendages to the end of the bacula, maybe that's triggering the female to ovulate. Um, or in other situations, it's been suggested that maybe the shape of the bacula actually helps to remove um, previous uh, semen that's been placed in there. So if there's some kind of fierce sperm competition going on, if the female is mating with several mates, um, then perhaps the baculum plays a role in removing uh, the former mate sperm before then you deposit your own. So yeah, there's lots of different hypotheses. There's no shortage of hypotheses. Um, it's then just how we, we go about testing them. Is it actually attached to the skeleton in any way? Or is it just uh, free-floating towards the tip of the penis? Yeah, yeah, it's just entirely free-floating. A lot of people ask me that. They seem to assume that it's, yeah, it's going to be yeah, rigidly attached to the pelvis or something. Um, no, no, it just sits free-floating um, in that gland tissue. So in between, in between the, your, your trunk, say, and the tip of the penis is going to be um, a whole set of uh, very small intrinsic mus muscles attached the penis to the pelvis. And then the, the shaft, which is um, composed of these bodies called the corpus cavernosum, and they're the bits that really fill with blood. Uh, and then towards the end of them is where the glands uh, begins, and that's just where the, the bone is. So if the baculum is confined to the tip of the penis, and in many species the tip actually represents a large proportion of the whole penis, how does the baculum interact uh, with erectile tissue as well? Is it the case that um, the shaft is what will uh, experience the erection and make the penis longer in that instance? Or is it the case that uh, the erection will add volume around the baculum? Um, yeah, so the, the, uh, most of the, the uh, erectile tissue is confined to what we call the shaft. The, the glands does have a little bit of hydrostatic pressure there, but it's nowhere near compared to what is in this corpus cavernosum body. Um, so, yes, you would, you would expect, the hypothesis would be that in, in species where they have comparatively less shaft and comparatively more glands, that they would uh, increase in length less when they get an erection. Um, I would assume that there's almost no data on that. Um, almost impossible to, to quantify. Um, potentially there is some out there, but I have no idea. So it's, it's one of the problems that we have in trying to understand the, the morphology of the penis. When I'm doing these dissections, I've got these cadavers. Obviously, we're looking at everything in a, in a flaccid state. Um, so one of the really uh, innovative things that some of the people in the States are doing is then taking this cadaveric material and then effectively injecting it with um, pressurized saline and then ligating uh, the, the, the end of the penis or the bit closest to the body um, to maintain that pressure and then effectively fixing the whole specimen in, a, in an erect state. So we actually get a better idea of the whole geometry uh, of the of the unit um, in its state in which it's actually used in copulation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should, there's some great videos online of, of Patty Ben's group doing it. It's fascinating. 
I can't, I can't believe that it's someone's job to give dead animals erections. Yes. Yeah, you'd ask, uh, Russell's got a funny story of me scanning in, in Henry Mosley in Manchester. Uh, I was, it was actually for the fellowship application and I wanted to include a CT scan of um, of the genitals of just a rat that we had, you know, in the freezer, just as a you know proof of concept that we kind of could do this. It's not totally crazy. Um, so I was on this like fierce deadline for this fellowship. So we tried to scan this rat and we tried to to inject it um, to fix it in an erect state, and, and it wasn't happening. But we hadn't um, kind of ligated the the penis, so it, everything was kind of flowing back out again. So then. Um, Russell had to, he lives fairly nearby, so he ran home and stole some Fred from his wife who was doing like needlework or something. <laughs> and, uh, and then ran back to the CC unit uh, with this Fred, which we could then like tie off to kind of maintain pressure. Uh, it worked relatively well. So, yeah, all credit to, to Anna and her needlepoint for getting me a fellowship. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not cutting that out. That's going to go in. So just to clarify, Russell, that. <laughs> that's Russell Garwood. He was on mm. um, one of the earliest episodes that we did. It was must have been like episode thirteen or something on the Carboniferous um, uh, arthropods. So if you've not yet listened to that, uh, give it a re-listen and all the time uh, think about Russell giving this poor dead rat an erection. <laughs> he also has a track record of working on genitalia as well. No. He had some of the oldest genitalia. Oh, well, in, in arthropods, I guess it's mm-hmm. uh, very different. Uh, you don't have to, as you were saying, like um, with um, genitals in uh, arthropods, yeah, they, they're made of cuticle. They're not going anywhere. And you can see them in the fossil record. So, yeah. Uh, and, it, and they're like one of the primary uh, things that you use to determine a uh, species is the genitals in arthropods. So. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Arthropods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so what proportion of mammals actually possess a baculum? I know that we don't. Uh, are we the only ones? Um, no, no, well, not at all. But it is, it's way more common to have a baculum as a mammal than to not have a baculum. Um, so the most recent survey that's published a year or two ago, um, so they managed to look at just over a thousand uh mammals so that's what about fifth of all extant mammals and of them about 90 percent have a baculum so it is really common um all of the rodents have a baculum almost all of the bats have a baculum so just those two groups alone you've got you know most of your mammals um so yeah it's pretty rare um to to lose the baculum um we're the only uh, ape that doesn't have a baculum um although if you look in chimps it's extremely reduced uh and in some instances you know, i've scanned a chimp specimen that just doesn't have a baculum at all so it does seem to be to be on the way out in those groups is it in one group or very closely related groups that the baculum's lost or is it that maybe one species per order or something has lost it is it is it phylogenetically um constrained the loss of a baculum yeah, so uh, yeah, it's a really interesting question. There was a, this really nice study done fairly recently where they were just tracing presence, absence of the baculum across uh, all mammals. So uh, it's only placental mammals that have a baculum. Uh, and then within those placental mammals, it seems like the baculum has actually independently evolved like numerous times. I think they say something like nine times the baculum has actually independently evolved. So it's not a homologous structure is, is the current thinking. Uh, and then subsequently in some of those groups, it's been lost again. So um, if you look in carnivores, for example, um, all carnivores have a baculum apart from um, two uh, groups. So the hyenas uh, have lost it um, and the binturong has lost it. Um, a binturong? Um, Never heard of <laughs> I they call it like a do they call it a, like a bear cat or something like that? Yeah, it's a it's a strange kind of enigmatic creature. It looks a it looks a bit like a fossil, but it's not a fossil. Oh, fair enough. Well, I'm learning new stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it seems um, 
in most groups, there's a, there's a case of it being lost again um, in bats. Some of the bats have lost it, although the vast majority have it. Um, also in primates, occasionally some of the primates lose it. It's only in rodents, really, I think, that, where they've evolved it and then they've all kept it. So what's it actually look like and how much morphological diversity, different shapes are there between the bacula of different groups or species? Uh, God, this huge morphological diversity. Um, so just take a look at my Twitter account. There's just constant pictures of just genitals and baculum. There's some crazy shapes in there. Um, so it'll range from being just like a basic kind of grain of rice almost, um, or just a beam to having, um, you know, bizarre, um, kind of distal, appendages kind of really hooked and curved um sometimes it'll end in just kind of you know a, a, a round termination sometimes it'll bifurcate into two sometimes it'll be three uh sometimes it'll have this crazy kind of almost ice cream scoop on the end of it um along its mid shaft um sometimes it's just it's just like a solid beam in um, things like the, the canids in dogs um, and in mustelids like weasels, uh, it's got a really distinct groove running on the, along the underside of this bone. Uh, and that's called the urethral groove. And that seems to be where the urethra um, sits and runs uh, directly underneath the bone. So that's another hypothesis about what the baculum might be doing. Maybe it's there to protect the urethra to make sure uh, this tube doesn't get you know twisted or kinks in it, so it can still deliver sperm when it needs to. So yeah, there's just there's insane morphological diversity, and that's why um, people like to use it in terms of you know, species identification. Um, but it is also why it is um, in terms of methods actually quite tricky uh, to study uh, because the diversity is extreme. So we can't use or we struggle to use some of the more traditional techniques like geometric morphometrics, which would, as a paleontologist, it'd be you know, typically the way that you could you know, quantify shape changes in a lineage. Um, that's just really problematic when you've got such diverse structures. It's not clear you know, where you would put your landmarks for GMM. Are there different morphologies within a single species? Um, so there is much less variation um, within a species than between, hence why it's useful for, for species identification. Um, there is a little bit of variation in the bone, not as much as you would think. Um, perhaps there's more variation in the kind of external soft tissues that we're not seeing. But in terms of the bone, it's relatively conservative. There is a little bit of um, ontogenetic variability, um, but Otherwise, I mean, it's yeah, it's it's relatively well constrained within a species. And and you mentioned on on genetic variability, so that's uh, differences as it grows. Uh, do we know much about how the baculum grows and how it affects uh, the appearance of the penis? Well, we don't know anything about how the baculum actually affects the functioning of the penis. I don't think. Um, in terms of ontogenetic sequences, there are a few documented, but again, not a huge number. Typically in species that are very easy to get hold of, you know, like I think there's some on fox, um, maybe some on pole cat. Um, but yeah, not many. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, how it grows, uh, it also varies across mammals. Uh, and that's one of the convincing arguments for how it's not homologous um, because you know it just in terms of how even how it ossifies it seems to differ between groups between rodents and bats sometimes even the actual type of bone it's made up of um, can even differ so yeah more more evidence that actually perhaps it's, it's evolved independently several times you've been working specifically with the carnivoran baculum which animals are included within the carnivora um, so new carnivores, you're kind of split between two main groups. So you've got your, your caniforms, dog-like, and the feliforms, uh, the cat-like. So in, in caniforms, you've got things like dogs, obviously, um, bears, pinnipeds, things like seals and sea lions, um, mustelids. So that includes your ferrets and your weasels uh, and the procyonids, so the uh, raccoons. Um, and then in your feliforms, you've got cats uh, and then also things like mongoose, um, meerkats uh, and also the, the enigmatic fossa. 
And why are carnivores a good group to study? Why not the bats or the rats that all have them? Um, might be boring if they all had them. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of uh, practical reasons, they're quite well represented in museum collections uh, and in um, my collaboration with Edinburgh Museum, they acquire quite a lot of carnivores. Um, probably that's probably just purely because of size, it seems that, I, you know, sometimes I'll go into collections and you can look in, in rodents. Baculum is not always there. Maybe it's just difficult to find. Um, but anyway, that yeah, typically, if you're going to find baculum in a museum collection, that you're most likely to find it um, for some um, for some carnivores. Uh, and also carnivores are, are really interesting. They've got a whole array of different social structures. So you can have groups that are monogamous, some that live solitary lives, some that live in harems. So then you'd kind of expect lots of variation in the amount of um, pressure they're under in terms of sexual selection. Uh, and they also got a whole variety of different mating habits. So in terms of just, you know, intromission or copulation length, you know, cats copulate for, you know, five, ten seconds for about, and then, you know, they do that multiple times. Whereas, you know, when you look at things like ferrets, they can, you know, one, one period of intermission can last, you know, up to three or four hours. So there's a huge variety there. Um, some mammal, some carnivores are induced ovulators, um, some spontaneously ovulate. So we're kind of covering all of our bases in terms of lots of unusual um, behaviors and strategies in terms of mating and then looking if we can correlate what we see in penis morphology and in baculum shape and size to that. So the penis isn't the only part of the male reproductive system. So do we see any correlation between the baculum and any other sexually controlled or sexually purpose structures? So the most common thing that people uh, tend to look at is the testes size, so relative testes mass, uh, the size of your testicles relative to your body mass. Uh, and typically we take that as an indication, a metric of how strong uh, the post copulatory sexual selection pressures are. So that is if the female is mating with multiple males, uh, males are, are competing to make sure that it's their sperm that fertilizes the egg. And typically in, in those uh, species where that pressure is the greatest, they tend to have relatively larger testes for their body size. Uh, and we do see some of those correlations. So uh, previously, it's been found in pinnipeds, the length of their baculum does seem to be correlated um, to testy size. And now we're with our work beginning to see it not just in size, but also in shape of the structure, how elaborate uh, the bone is, does seem to be correlated to some of these features like testy size. The penis also has a kind of directionality, if you will. So uh, at one end, uh, you've got the uh, well, the business end, and the other side is where it's attached to the body. Uh, do we see any corresponding effects on how the baculum evolves? So is the tip of the baculum normally more elaborate and the base of it is a lot more conservative? Uh, so, I mean, first of all, anecdotally, uh, yes, it would seem so that you only really tend to see uh, these kind of unusual um, elaborations uh, towards the tip of the baculum. Um, that being said, there are exceptions to that. So in, in the dogs, for example, they have this extra structure kind of along mid shaft, um, which is this extra kind of ridges and grooves which is where um, this structure attaches which is what the dogs use for for getting locked together so you know famously dogs after they've copulated they tend to be tied together for an extended period of time afterwards typically they're kind of tied bum to bum um, so that's where this structure uh, attaches and you can see that and that is away from the tip that's further down uh, towards the, the middle of the baculum but yeah typically we do see that uh, the tip is more elaborate and that is something that we're trying to analyze at the moment we're running um, different different ways of quantifying shape and we're running that on the kind of base, mid and, and, chat and tip of the, of the baculum. Um, and then even moving beyond the baculum, um, you know, mammals also have uh, penile spines on the outside of their penis on the top, on the surface of the glands. And as I say, that is typically just on the glands. You get in primates, especially penile spines and in cats, 
uh, and they're always on on the tip of the penis. Um, the one somewhat exception to that is the well, the fossa, um, this kind of very strange Madagascan carnivore. Um, does have you know, crazy amounts of spines on the outside of its penis, um, and that is still restricted to the tip. But the tip is incredibly long in in the fossa, so that's a very extended period of, of spines. And what is the purpose of these spines? Is is that actually to discourage the female from having further intercourse with other males? Mm, that's an interesting question. That's kind of a, an idea that's been developed more in the the invertebrates. So this idea of the male causing trauma to the female, so then perhaps you can't remate, uh, and that's a way of making sure that you know your sperm are the ones that fertilise the egg. Uh, I'm not sure that that's been really kind of quantified in in mammals. Um, again, anecdotally. Um, as I was talking about the fossa having these you know, crazy spines, uh, there have been reports of um, in zoos when the fossa have been copulating uh, subsequently after the mating is finished and the male's kind of dismounted, that he does have um, blood uh, on his genitals. So if that is from the female, then perhaps it is true that it is causing um, some degree of harm in there. Um, the other idea is that it is to do with um, triggering ovulation. So in the cats, particularly, people think that's what the spines might be there for. And they're really, in the, in the cats, they're relatively well developed, but they're really not that obvious, not not compared to something like the fossa. Okay, so let's finally get to the fossil record. We're paleocasts, we should be talking about things. <laughs> so uh, since the baculum isn't attached to the rest of the skeleton, are they often found in isolation? Uh, I mean, it's pretty rare to find one just in isolation. It's more almost the opposite in the sense that I would imagine we're quite often finding fossils where, you know, in terms of the, you know, phylogenetic bracket, maybe they should have a baculum, um, but we're just not finding it. And maybe it's either just kind of drifted away because it's not, you know, directly attached to the skeleton. Maybe it gets damaged and destroyed. It's just not fossilized. It could be the case that um, maybe it just actually doesn't get removed during excavation. We don't don't realize what we're looking for. Maybe even it gets prepped away. If it's that small. It can be confused for things like ribs. Um, but very occasionally, in things like uh, mass deposits, then you'll find, you know, uh, baculum that aren't necessarily associated with one particular skeleton, but just because there are lots of bones, uh, odds are you're going to find some bacula. So the Bria tar pits is a classic example. We've seen quite, quite a lot of direwolf bacula there. Um, also, occasionally, um, things like uh, cave fall deposits, we find Ice Age cave bears and we find their baculum as well. Could you identify a fossil in the fossil record just from its baculum alone? <laughs> um, should you ever identify a fossil in the fossil record on the basis of one bone alone? Is that, is that a controversial thing to ask in Paleocast? I, um, uh, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't know if anyone uh, ever has. I think, uh, as ever with Paleo, I'd be more comfortable knowing a lot more about how things work in modern taxa before we then start applying it too much to the fossil record. Um, so, you know, that being said, I, you know, I've been saying the baculum is really useful for, for species ID. So it should be, um, but we need to do a better job of quantifying, describing shape in modern taxa, I think, before we then start applying it to the fossil record. Do you know of any instances where there is a fossilised baculum and people have just got no idea where it's from? I don't think so, no. No, not that I'm aware of. Well, there we go. That, that's, that's <laughs> Sorry, no, just because I think people will get, people tend to, uh, well, there is a, a lack of evidence, but I would imagine some of these things, yeah, just look like, just little rib bones or like some random little bit of toe bone. I mean, the baculum of a gorilla is the size of a grain of rice. If you found a gorilla skeleton, what are the chances that you're going to also recover the grain of rice and then get know what to do with that? Um, so, yeah, pretty, pretty rare. 
Do you think in general that paleontologists overlook the baculum and what it could potentially tell you about um, the evolution of uh, these mammals? No, I don't think that's fair. No, I think the, on the odd occasions where we do find it, we tend to get very excited about it because it's quite unusual. Um, so the few examples that we have of baculum being found in association with skeletons um, tend to be pretty well documented because it's quite exciting. Um, so there have been you know a couple of fairly you know early fossil, well, early mammals, you know, Eocene age, things from Messel, things from Green River, um, where they have found. Um, a baculum there and that's that, that's pretty well documented so we've we've just found a fossil mammal and fortunately it has its baculum preserved has has there been any instances or precedents for being able to reconstruct uh the copulation or the reproductory behaviors of a species based solely on its baculum yeah, so there aren't many instances of that happening, but um, there is a nice case of a primate that was found um, in the, the Eocene Messel, uh, and that has a, a really you know well developed baculum given its body size. It's really pretty pretty lengthy baculum, uh, and the authors do a really good job of of then going out and collecting lots and lots of of modern data from modern primates, looking at baculum length and looking how that correlates to um, mating behavior. So in particular, I think they're looking at copulation duration, or whether or not they um, have, you know, um, short bouts of copulation, but multiple times, or they just copulate you know, very quickly and that's it. Or do they have, you know, one period of copulation, but for a very extended period of time. And they find this nice relationship between, I think, having a longer baculum, you're more likely to be engaging in very prolonged periods of sex. So once you've grounded that in, you know, lots of extant data, then they go and you know, measure the, the fossil baculum and you can use it in a predictive capacity. What would be the one big question about bacula you'd like to be able to answer or genitals in general? Um, so it's got to be how are they behaving actually in vivo, in copula? So morphology is, is great. It's comparatively uh easy working on museum collections um, but really we need to be trying to understand how these animals actually go about the you know the, the physical act the biomechanics of mating we know almost nothing about it um, so there's only in, in humans there's been I think one or two studies on on the actual mechanics of human copulation where they've you know put humans in an MRI scanner whilst they're copulating we can actually see you know what these structures are doing in real time um, but that's relatively rare now if you think about um, all of the kind of you know, functional morphology the biomechanics kinematic studies that we do on on modern animals and then you know how we apply them to the fossil record you know, we're obsessed with locomotion we're obsessed with feeding um, even now, you know, breathing, the mechanics of breathing is becoming, you know, more popular to study. But, you know, mating is, is fundamentally really important, but we know almost nothing about the actual mechanics of how does mating work, um, especially in, in vertebrates. So so that's got to be the next the next big step is can we image some of these animals copulating in real time? Can we see what the baculum is is actually doing right then to end on i've got a couple of little bonus questions for you that uh i am just very curious about not about the research but what's it like for you as a researcher telling people what you study yeah it's an interesting one um i have gotten over my embarrassment fairly quickly um generally all of the feedback i get is is just super positive i think it's a case of people people laugh and then people think about it so you know there's the kind of of course you've got to you've got to laugh you've got to chuckle um but then all of a sudden people are there but but actually what does it do or just it's actually amazing to me um it's not surprising how little people know about about their own genitals so, you know, I'd be talking about the baculum. I, I, you know, I work on the baculum. It's a penis bone in mammals. And then people go, oh, that's really interesting. Wait, do we have a baculum? And it's, just, it's like, it's, it's fascinating. And that's, you know, maybe that's a function of our, you know, sex education system that actually we really don't know much about 
our own genitalia. So people are normally normally fascinated. Um, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I have occasionally been, I've been accused of uh, ambulance chasing uh, in terms of, you know, choosing uh, this kind of topic because, uh, you know, undeniably it does draw media attention. Um, but uh, that's, I just find it fascinating. It's not, I don't count it as ambulance chasing. And the media are very interest, interested in what you're doing. I mean, sex sells. I mean, we're here talking about sex uh, on uh, PaleoCast as well, and hopefully this will do well. People are interested. Do you find that the media jumps all over this stuff? Do you know, I am... Um, so in this last year, I did a British Science Association Media Fellowship. Um, so I was based at the BBC North uh, on their science desk with Victoria Gill. She's like one of the science journalists. Um, as part of that, we went to this training program uh, in London and they had a couple of different um, science journalists come in uh, to talk to us. And one of them was uh, one of the, the guys head up in um, The New Scientist. And he was just talking about the kind of things that that they like to to put on their front cover. They can you know predict pretty well how many copies of New Scientist they're going to sell uh, by the the topic that's on their front page. And apparently for them, sex is an absolute nightmare. No one wants to buy the New Scientist if the front cover is on sex. So that was yeah, that was surprising to me. They say it's um, the kind of the reading it on the train phenomena. Would people be embarrassed to be seen reading it on the train? Uh, and then that can, yeah, that can impact the sales. So I think it's just, it's, I guess it's finding the right journalists. It's about making sure that you can tell the story that you want to tell. Um, so, you know, undeniably, someone like the Metro are going to be interested in these stories, but it's whether or not, you know, they get across the, the content of the science that you really want to talk about. And what's next for you then with these bacula? Where do you want to take this? <laughs> uh, what's next for me? Well, the fellowship is coming to an end uh, in about a year's time. Uh, I now, uh, bless her, have a new PhD student who has uh, just started her PhD in January and she's going to be particularly focusing on um, mustelid genitalia, copulation, um, the, the evolution, co-evolution of their structures in, in males and females. Um, so if you see her, you know, presenting at any conferences anytime soon, you should probably buy her a beer because she will have deserved it, the kind of dissections that she's doing. Um, so yes, uh, my my future next year is very um, mustelid intensive. We're dissecting some ferrets tomorrow, so that should be interesting okay then charlotte well thank you very much for joining us today thank you for having me paleocast was brought to you by dave marshall with joe keating laura soul liz martin silverstone and caitlin colary it was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast, and like us at facebook.com forward slash paleocast to get all the latest news.